Good morning everyone and welcome to this service of Celtic Communion here in the parish of Brayton. It's really good to have you with us this morning as we gather together virtually to worship God. As always we've sent out the order of service and the hymns and reading sheet so if you do have those please do follow along as we go through the service this morning. But if you don't have them, then that's absolutely fine. Just allow God to speak to you through the words of the service and join in where you can. We're going to begin our service by lighting our candle as a reminder that God is with us wherever we are this morning and wherever we're worshipping him. So if you have a candle at home, you might like to light that as I light this one here. Let's take a couple of moments to still ourselves and remember that we are in God's presence. And then we'll begin with our opening prayer on page two. Heaven is here and earth and the space is thin between them. Distance may divide, but Christ's promise unites those bound by time, those blessed by eternity. Let heaven be glad, let the whole earth cry glory. Heaven is here and earth, and the church above and below is one. The saints from far back, and those who left us not long ago, and only sight prevents us from seeing them, one with us on the other side. Let heaven be glad, let the whole earth cry glory. Heaven is here and earth, and the God who made them is present. The Lamb, glorious on the throne, sits beside us. The Spirit of God, the Dove, makes her resting place among us. Let heaven be glad, let the whole earth cry glory. Our first hymn this morning is a great prayer that God would shape our lives and ourselves and be with us now and into eternity. So let's join with Pete as he leads us in singing, Be Thou My Vision. Oh, 
As each of us comes to worship God this morning, we'll all come bringing different things from the week that has passed. And those will include times when we're aware that we haven't allowed God to shape our vision, to influence the way that we act and think and speak, when we haven't given him the glory in our lives. So we're going to take a moment now to acknowledge those times before him and ask for his forgiveness using the prayer of wholeness, which you can find on page three. Please join in with the words in bold. Holy God, maker of all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. Let us in silence confess our faults and admit our frailty. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to my brokenness, to the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to our brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. The Collect for this second Sunday before Advent, which you can find on your reading sheet. Heavenly Lord, you long for the world's salvation. Stir us from apathy, restrain us from excess, and revive in us new hope that all creation will one day be healed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn now to our Bible readings and our first reading today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labour pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. For a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Our Gospel reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Let us listen. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. When I went off to university about 15 years ago now, I was your classic studious student. That is hard to say. I worked hard at school and for the most part, I really enjoyed it. I was determined to get good grades and for the most part, I managed to do so. And I didn't really see any reason for that to stop being the case. But when I got to university, two things happened. Firstly, I went to a university where everybody got good grades. You had to get good grades in order to get in. So all of a sudden, my achievements weren't especially remarkable. They were the norm and they were expected. And secondly, I started to think about faith. I had been brought up in a Christian home. I went to Sunday school. I got confirmed age 12, something I took very seriously and was very excited about. But in my teenage years, faith took a bit of a back seat. I didn't stop believing in God, though I had some pretty big questions about him. But other things just took priority. Nobody was particularly calling any attention to my faith, and so it slipped into the background. 
But when I went to university, for some reason, I found myself vowing to decide what I actually believed. And so I began to explore my faith afresh. There's lots that I could tell you about that time, but the moment I want to share with you in relation to today's gospel reading happened in my college chapel. I was in the chapel choir and we were singing a service of Evensong in my first term at university. The preacher that evening was the college chaplain, a woman called Lindsay. In her sermon, she told the story of how she had trained to be a lawyer, but then felt called to ordination and so she changed tack and became a vicar. I thought this was ridiculous. Why on earth would you spend all that time and hard work training to pursue your dream career and then, in my eyes at the time, throw it all away and become a vicar? Who does that? But despite thinking that it was faintly crazy, I also couldn't stop thinking about it. Here was I, someone who prided myself on my academic achievements, suddenly in an environment where I wasn't going to get the best grades anymore. Don't get me wrong, I continued to work hard and I aimed to do well, and there's nothing wrong with that. But my identity as this high achiever was challenged. And added to that, I was asking all of these questions about faith and whether I believed what I'd grown up saying I believed and what all that meant. And these two things I was grappling with came together in Lindsay's sermon that evening, as I suddenly realised that some of the things I had put my hope in, good grades, success, pats on the back, were not guaranteed to continue always. They couldn't be depended upon. And what's more, Lindsay was saying that there was something worth much more than those things, that she so much more, in fact, that she had felt willing to change the entire course of her life for it. Something or someone that made it worth taking that risk. The willingness to take risks plays a part in the parable of the talents which we've just heard. A master gives his slaves a particular number of talents each. A talent was a unit of measurement, in this case used to describe a particular sum of money and then he goes away. He doesn't give them any instructions, but they all seem instinctively to know what they'll do. The first two trade with their talents and make more of them. The third digs a hole and hides his talent, his sum of money, in the ground. When the master returns, he is delighted with the first two slaves and angry with the third. Now, I'll be honest, I've always instinctively disliked this parable because I really feel for the third guy. He says he was worried about his master being angry with him, so he kept the money safe to make sure he didn't lose it and make him more angry. That kind of seems fairly sensible to me. I can definitely think of instances when I've played it safe and avoided risks so that nothing goes wrong. So why is the master pleased with the other two and angry with him? And what is Jesus trying to tell us about God through this? Well, the first thing to make clear is that I don't think we're meant to see ourselves as slaves lorded over by God as our master. As with many of the parables, Jesus is using a well-known image from the time to make a point. He's not intending this parable to condone slavery, though unfortunately we do know that passages like this were used and misused in the past for this exact purpose. But what we see in the master is someone giving good gifts to people and allowing those who receive them to decide what they do with them. And perhaps this tells us something about how God is with us. He gives us good gifts to use as we choose. This parable comes a couple of chapters after Jesus has warned the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, that they have lost sight of God amid all the rules and rituals which were meant to help them worship him. They had been given many gifts from God, the law of Moses to help them to live, the temple so that they had God's presence with them, and the promises of blessings from God. So perhaps Jesus is suggesting that the Pharisees had acted like that third servant or slave, 
They had buried those gifts God had given them, kept them to themselves. They wouldn't let those deemed to be sinners in that society, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, receive the blessings that God had given them for fear that they would corrupt them somehow. And they were outraged when Jesus seemed to have more time for those people than he did for them. Of course, Jesus comes to help us see that everyone is sinful. We all fall short, but they can't see that yet. This is in stark contrast then to the disciples who are not perfect themselves by any means, but they risk everything to follow Jesus and go on to share the blessings that he makes possible through his death and resurrection with as many people who will listen to them, ultimately risking their lives to do so. Their response to Jesus is perhaps more reminiscent of the first two servants who took what they were given and traded with it to make more. This was far riskier than what the third servant did because they could have lost the money altogether, but they chose to take that risk. The disciples choose to risk using the blessings and opportunities that God gave them through Jesus to bring about something new, a new community of believers who themselves then shared those gifts with others. God's kingdom began to bud and blossom through them and their risk taking. God gives all of us different gifts, blessings and opportunities in our lives and we're called not to look enviously at what other people have but to look at what we have and ask God how we can use it. And using it doesn't necessarily mean doing things and adding to our to-do lists. It could be as much about the way we live the attitude we take to things, the way we treat people, the choices we make about how we spend our time, the way we prioritise our relationship with God. But at the heart of all of this, and at the heart of following Jesus, there is always an inherent risk. Risk that we might be viewed differently or even negatively. Risk that will be rejected if we try and show God's love to others. Risk that our life will go in a different direction from the one that we had planned for it to go in. Risk that we'll lose things as well as gain them. Faith is risky. Following Jesus involves taking risks and that can make it uncomfortable at times, just as this parable is a bit uncomfortable to listen to. Fifteen years ago, hearing Lindsay's sermon unsettled me. Not only because I realised that the things I put my hope in weren't 100% guaranteed, but also because I suddenly saw that choosing to follow Jesus wasn't just a decision that I could make in my head. I wanted to decide what I believed. But if I decided that I believed in Jesus, then that decision had to affect my whole life. I couldn't just take the gifts and the blessings and the promises of God and bury them ready to come back to on a rainy day. I had to take them and live in the light of them. I had to put my faith in Jesus and live out that faith. Ultimately, my decision to do that led to me, the girl who laughed at the absurdity of a lawyer choosing to become a vicar, offering myself for ordination. But that's not what it meant at first. That came years down the line. At first, it meant choosing to trust Jesus in the everyday. My study, my relationships, the way I lived at university. Choosing to tell people that I had faith and sharing with them why I thought Jesus was worth trusting in. I wasn't very good at that, by the way. Sometimes I think God called me to ordination so that I had no excuse not to talk about him. A little later on, it meant choosing to do an unpaid internship for a church when that really made no sense in terms of finances or career and I had no idea why I was doing it or how I'd finance it. I just knew that God was asking me to. And again, that might sound very brave of me, but it took me a good six months or so to make that decision and it's a wonder that my church small group at the time didn't throw me out for going over the same pros and cons list pretty much every week. It's meant all sorts of things over the years and along the way there have been mistakes, 
missed opportunities and many times when I've chosen to play it safe rather than take a risk, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. There have been instances when I've been obedient and done what I've felt that God is asking me to do and instances when I've run very hard in the opposite direction. Luckily God has a way of bringing us to where he wants us to be even if the way we get there is quite long and convoluted. I'm not someone who especially enjoys taking risks. You aren't likely to see me jumping out of a plane or bungee jumping anytime soon. But I've learned that when the gifts and blessings of God are involved, taking a risk can lead to a manner of wonderful outcomes you could never have foreseen. It isn't always easy and it isn't always obvious what those outcomes are. Sometimes you don't find out until years down the line. But as our reading from 1 Thessalonians reminds us, Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Jesus is with us in the risk taking. In a few chapters time in Matthew, Jesus will send out his disciples to make more disciples, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And with that command, he makes a promise. I will be with you always to the end of the age. So let's not bury the gifts, the blessings, the good news of God given to us in Jesus. Let's share them, step into them, bless others with them. Let's take a risk and live our faith out in the everyday and see what wonderful things unfold as the kingdom of God begins to bud and flower around us. Amen. We're now going to affirm our faith in the God who is always with us, using the words on page five of our order of service. With the whole church, we affirm that we are made in God's image, befriended by Christ, empowered by the Spirit. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all creation, we affirm the miracle and wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God, forever at work, in ourselves and the world. We're going to pray now and for our prayers today I'd just like to hold some space really for us to pray as we feel led by God. You might like to use the space to just sit and listen and see if there's anything that God is prompting you to do or to um, pray for. You might have people who are particularly on your hearts today that you would like to use this space to pray for. You might like to pray for our world. Uh, for our community, for our country, whatever you feel led by God to pray for in this space, this time is yours to use with him. Let us pray.
Lord, we thank you that you have heard the prayers that we have spoken and we thank you for any promptings of the spirit that you have given us in return. Lord, would you help us to go forth from this place and be willing to take risks for you and for your kingdom. Show us, Lord, how you would have us live. Show us the way to bring others to know your love for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We draw our prayers together using the prayer that Jesus taught us, which you can find on page six. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In a moment we will offer God the bread and wine and this is also the time when we offer him our other gifts, including those of our finances, if we're able to. So could I invite you to hold either your offering or your hands representing your offering out to God as we pray. God of goodness and grace, receive the gifts we offer and grant that our whole life may give you glory and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to use communion prayer two today, which you can find on page 10 of your order of service. And when we come to the point of receiving the bread and the wine, you might like to use the prayer for spiritual communion, which you can find on the second side of your hymns and reading sheet in the absence of, in the absence of us being able to receive the bread and wine together at the moment. This is the table not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. You have tried to follow and you who have fa failed. Come, not because it is I who invite you, it is our Lord. It is his will that those who want him should meet with him here. Now let us hear the story of how this sacrament began. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, broke it and gave it to them with these words. This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. Later, he took a cup of wine, saying, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. So now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of this world, which Christ will make special. And as he said a prayer before sharing, 
let us do that too. Gratitude, praise, hearts lifted high, voices full and joyful, these you deserve. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no faith and no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way or turned away, you did not abandon us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide in welcome. And look, you prepared a table for us, offering not just bread, not just wine, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed and made new again. You are worth all our pain and all our praise. So now in gratitude, we join our voices to those of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For us you were born, for us you healed, preached, taught and showed the way to heaven. For us you were crucified and for us after death you rose again. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, for all you have done and all that you have promised, what have we to offer? Our hands are empty. Our hearts are sometimes full of wrong things. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs from under your table. But with you is mercy and the power to change us. So as we do in this place what you did in an upstairs room, Send your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine that they may become for us your body, healing, forgiving and making us whole and that we may become for you your body, loving and caring in the world until your kingdom comes. Amen. Look, friends, here is our Lord coming to us in bread broken and wine outpoured. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us say the post-communion prayer together, which you can find on page two of your reading sheet. Gracious God, in this holy sacrament, you give substance to our hope. Bring us at the last to that fullness of life for which we long. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. We continue in prayer with the prayer on page 14. Please join in with the words in bold. Let us pray in gratitude, deep gratitude, for this moment, this meal, this day, and those of us gathered here. We give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people, because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. May God bring us to the land of peace, to the country of the King, 
to the joy of eternity. Praise to the Father, praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, the three in one. We're now going to share the peace of God with one another, either with those with whom we're watching or remotely with one another. Christ, who has nourished us, is our peace. Strangers and friends, male and female, old and young, he has broken down the barriers to bind us to him and to each other. Having tasted his goodness, let us share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace. Peace be with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful to worship God together. We'll be here again at the same time next week, 10.30 on our YouTube channel for a service of Holy Communion and we really hope to see you again then. Just one other notice today uh, from uh, Reverend Roy Shaw, who's one of the retired ministers in the parish. He is leading a retreat in daily life for Advent. He's done uh, this before uh, for Holy Week earlier this year. And I know those who took part really appreciated it. So this is another opportunity to join Roy in a retreat in daily life as a way of marking Advent. Uh, you can do this by Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, WhatsApp or on the phone um, and it involves uh, committing to uh, a period of prayer each day with some suggested ideas by Roy and keeping a note of what you um, might find comes out of that prayer time and then chatting to Roy in confidence for up to 20 minutes each day about that experience of prayer. So if you'd like to find out more or to make this retreat in daily life as you mark the start of Advent, then please do contact Roy. Um, the details will be in the description box below, but his email address is revroyshaw, all one word, at protonmail.com. But as I say, the details will be below, so do go there um, and uh, make the most of this opportunity if you can. And thank you to Roy for offering this. So now a closing prayer. Again, please join in with the words involved. We're on page 15. From where we are to where you need us, Jesus, now lead on. From the security of what we know to the adventure of what you will reveal, Jesus, now lead on. To refashion the fabric of this world, until it resembles the shape of your kingdom. Jesus, now lead on. Because good things have been prepared for those who love God. Jesus, now lead on. Amen. Our final hymn reminds us that Jesus came to serve and calls us to do the same as we follow him. So please join in as we sing together, Servant King.
to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant King. So as we end, here's a blessing to send us out into the week ahead. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our souls. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and those whom you love and remain with you this day and always. Amen.